Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, RIT's Hospitality and Tourism Speaker Series. My name is Rick Legeski. I'm a faculty member in the Hospitality and Tourism Management Department, and very excited to welcome two wonderful alums uh, this evening that are going to share some of their experiences. Um, just a little housekeeping. Um, Please feel free as um, thoughts come to mind to just post them in the chat and I'll make sure that I get to them um, if I don't already cover them as we go through um, the evening. Uh, we'll start off with uh, questions back and forth um, with both Katya and Mike, and then we'll definitely have time uh, at the end to take those questions and any other questions that come to mind. Um, what I've noticed previously from the um, last speaker series is obviously some of you who are on today um, know personally Katya or Mike and what I'd like to make sure that we do at the end is also we can keep the zoom on for a bit um, so we can have some personal catch up um, for some of those of you that like to uh, say hi uh, to both Katya and Mike so it's kind of what the evening will go like we'll we'll do some questions back and forth um, between the two of them, then I'll take some of your questions and then we'll hopefully have some time to connect with both of them personally. So, so I'm gonna start off with um, a little background on each of them. It's uh, my pleasure that they're um, both students that I had in class and were involved, heavily involved in activities on campus. So got to know them quite well outside the classroom. Um, Katya I've known since, uh, 1998, I think, or two, no, way back, um, back, in right. <laughs> back in Croatia. So I'll start off with Katya, ladies first, and then I'll um, introduce Mike, and then we'll, we'll go back and forth with some questions. So uh, Katya is a Croatian Canadian. Uh, she finished her uh, elementary and high school uh, in Dubrovnik, Croatia, um, prior to moving um, for university here at RIT in Rochester, New York. Um, when she first came to RIT, she really wasn't sure what she wanted to do. So she enrolled in the university studies program, which is now our university exploration um, program. Um, as she says, after a few semesters of soul searching, uh, she enrolled in a hospitality course called Putting on the Ritz, um, which is led by me. Um, as she points out, um, she said she was impressed by the class, the department, and like-minded individuals she found herself sur surrounded by. So she decided to transfer into the hospitality and tourism program. She credits the incredible, resourceful, uh, empathetic and supportive faculty and staff as, as, as also the strong alumni network for her seamless transition into the professional world. Her professional journey consists of work with hospitality establishments such as restaurants and hotels in both Croatia and the United States in addition to nonprofits and a family-run businesses. She's been with the Dorchester Collection and the Beverly Hills Hotel on and off since 2016, where she did a internship as a human resources um, intern. Uh, Post-graduating fall of 2018, she joined the Dorchester as a full-time people and culture manager in training, later transitioning into learning and development manager a role which she currently holds uh, based in Los Angeles, California. So Katya, welcome. Thank you very much. Mike, who I've also known for quite a long time, uh, is an experienced front office leader who has been working within the industry since 2012. Most recently, he's part of the opening team of a new Four Seasons hotel that opened in Boston in 2019. His current role as a night manager provides the exciting opportunity to oversee the entire operations dur during the overnight shift. Mike graduated from the hospitality program here at RIT in Rochester, New York in 2013. And ever since his love of the outdoors has given him the opportunity to work in remote locations, doing co-ops in Alaska and Colorado. He's always seeking a new adventure and hopes to be part of another exciting hotel opening team soon. Mike, welcome tonight and thank you both for being here. Thank you for having me. So what I'll do is kind of work backwards a little bit. So kind of where you are now, um, all the way back to some of your experiences at, as students. So what's, what's nice is um, 
the Dorchester um, collection of hotels in Four Seasons are both luxury uh, level uh, brands that people know. Um, but maybe not everybody in the audience knows um, about these companies. So what I'll start off with is asking you to tell us a little bit about the company that you work for. Um, so I'll start off with Katya. Can you tell us a little bit about, most people probably have not stayed in a Dorchester hotel and probably do not know uh, some of its history and tradition. So could you give them a little sense of um, the company and, and maybe the property that you're primarily based around? Absolutely. So Dorchester Collection is a collection of nine uh, ultra luxury hotels worldwide. We're based in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, because Beverly Hills, it's its own incorporated city, um, as well as London, Paris, Rome, Milan, and most recently Dubai as well. We have an opening or we're in the midst of an opening, hopefully uh, COVID permitting by uh, the end of this year, beginning of 2021. Uh, so very, very small company, uh, fairly new as well in terms of establishments. And the neat part of this company is all these hotels were already established, uh, very, very well-known and established hotels within their own respective cities before being acquired uh, again into, into the collection. And the hotel that I uh, work for is the Beverly Hills Hotel, uh, also known as the Pink Palace. It is uh, really, really well known in the entertainment world. Uh, it's been there longer than Beverly Hills itself. I was founded in 1912 and Beverly Hills actually became an incorporated city in 1914. So we like to say that Beverly Hills was actually named after us uh, as everything around the hotel uh, was, uh, came at a later time and at a time when Hollywood was just starting out. So very privileged to be a huge part of the heritage and uh, the community. So there's a lot of pride placed in this hotel, obviously, it's been around for more than 100 years. And uh, that's, I, I don't know if there's anything I could add in that sense. It's, it's the place to be. Anyone who's anything in the entertainment world uh, or otherwise in the tech world uh, has been to the hotel. Uh, our Polo Lounge is perhaps the most well known for power dining in LA. So we, we do see uh, a very elite uh, circle of people that frequent our hotels. It's a great privilege to work there. Fantastic. Can you give us just a quick sense of, you know, what the average rate is or, you know, if we're going to stay in that hotel, um, you know, what are some of the rates to stay? Well, if you do stay at the hotel, do hit me up because we do have friends and family rates. Um, however, ADR is perhaps uh, around 1100 1200 a night on average, yeah. and that fluctuates depending on the season. Sure. And, yeah. Fantastic. So Mike, tell us a little about, you, you open a new property. Um, it's the Four Seasons, One Dalton. Can you tell us a little bit about your hotel and your company? Yeah, so um, Four Seasons is a little bit less um, in terms of age. Uh, the hotel just opening a few years ago, it was about a seven year project um, from when you could see it being built. But um, I mean, we, we built a new skyscraper in Boston. We changed the skyline. So that was a, a big deal with us. Um, it's a sleek, modern uh, design aspect, which is a little bit different from the more um, older Four Seasons where they look more regal and, and that dark wood kind of feel. So this is a little bit more sleek, modern, um, but it's been great to be part of that, that opening team um, joining when when the building was still being built and we didn't even have a lobby um, and walls were still not not even built. So it's been a great opportunity. Uh, the, the average rate for us we're seeing is, is right around 650 or so to about 800 in peak season. Um, but it's been uh, it's been quite a, a fun challenge opening up a hotel in downtown New York, uh, New York, Boston. Don't get in trouble in Boston now. <laughs> So um, size-wise, uh, how many rooms is that new property? Um, we're just around 200. I know Four Seasons is, is trying to always stay in that mid-scale uh, properties. So. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about Four Seasons as a company in terms yeah, of- four, Yeah, Four Seasons was founded um, not too long ago, around 80, 60-ish years. Um, and so it's, it's, we've got 47 properties in North America, but we are fully international global and constantly building new properties and, and opening them. 
Um, something that I, I should mention is Four Seasons is a management company. We don't actually own any of the buildings or hotels. Um, they have all been built or are already built um, and Four Seasons just manages the hotel. So that is kind of a big difference that we are as a company, just a management team. Um, we don't actually own any of the hotels that we manage. And I could be wrong, you can correct me, Mike. So with Four Seasons, I don't think any of the Four Seasons are actually franchised, correct? They're all, are they all management contracts? Correct, yep, they are all management contracts. So. Fantastic, so if, some, if one of us builds a hotel and wanna use the Four Seasons brand name, we need to have Four Seasons manage the hotel. Correct, yep, everything has to go through. They are very particular with that process, um, but everything is, is done through the management company. Fantastic. Well, Mike, since I have you, why don't you tell, um, tell us a little bit about your, your current position and, and maybe a little bit about opening the hotel? Yeah. So um, my current position is night manager. So I am effectively in charge of the entire property during the nighttime, generally from around 11 at night to eight in the morning. So that's overseeing everything in the operation from not just front desk, bellman, doorman, but in-room dining, security, engineering. Um, so anything that happens during those hours, um, which ideally no news is good news. Um, but so the, the typical day is, is kind of helping out the front desk and, and dealing with that and then transitioning to, to touching on all of those different uh, facilities that we have. Um, opening the property was quite a challenge. Um, our GM is very fond of saying there's no easy opening, um, which I think no one really understood until we were in, into that. Um, but it, it starts with hiring is the main thing. Um, and that took quite a while of, of hiring and training the team that we want uh, while the building was still being finished around us. Um, so it's a little bit difficult and, and odd when you think of training in a hotel when you're moving around, your front desk isn't built, you don't have drywall up in some location. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, I think for three months we were still wearing hard hats, goggles and, and vests walking around. So it was definitely a, a unique experience of opening up a property, but very rewarding as well. Fantastic. Now, Kati, I know that you've had experience working in operations, um, but now you're doing something a little bit different in terms of what you're doing in your position with the Dorchester Group. Can you talk a little bit about your, your current role and what that involves? Absolutely. I just wanted to say, Mike, it's so neat to see that to be part of an opening team. I've just heard that it's such a huge thing that you absolutely need to be a part of, I think, at some point in, in your hospitality career. So it's really neat that you did that and kind of sectioning into uh, the training piece, which you said was a, a huge, huge part of opening it up. And I can only, I can't even imagine, it's like, you don't even know what the space is going to look like yet. You're training yep. these people to operate within <laughs> the space that is still, you know, non-existent. So actually that's, that's a big piece of, of what I do, or it is what I do. So I'm a learning and development manager. I honestly didn't know this position even existed within the hospitality world uh, until I came to work for the Dorchester collection. So essentially it's a part of uh, what we call people and culture. Uh, it's, human resources, uh, known as human resources otherwise. And it's a position essentially overseeing the development of team members. So from their, ex uh, their employee experience journey from beginning to start. And the key reason this position exists within our hotel is because uh, we understand that, um, and I know Four Seasons, this is a huge part because we have a lot of people actually uh, from Four Seasons who've ended up working for Dorchester. So I know there's alignment in terms of placing the guest at the heart of everything that you do. So really being guest centric. And for us, the flip side of that means being employee centric. So you can't expect your team members to deliver on this ultimate guest experience if um, you're not treating them as, as they should be treated with respect, with dignity, um, having all these uh, great benefits, um, not to get into the whole HR conversation piece of it, but essentially ensuring that the team member experience is also uh, outstanding. So that's really part of what I do as part of the people and culture team. And my role really uh, 
focuses on facilitating training. So coming from compliance leadership, new team member orientation, um, any sort of projects of uh, rollouts that really enliven the essence of guest centricity, which is something we hold very near and dear to our hearts at DC. Fantastic. So um, Katya, give us a little sense for everybody that's listening and for people who watch this later, you know, what, what's an average day if there is such a thing for you in terms of when you start, kind of things that you do, um, walk us through like an average day and take COVID out of the picture. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what, what's, what's an average day look like for your position? Absolutely. So I think Mike and I can both agree and anyone who's ever worked in hospitality, there's no such thing as a typical day. <laughs> you walk in thinking you're going to know how things uh, roll out. Um, you have a rough out outline of how things out. Uh, end up panning out, of course. Uh, my role is slightly different as I do have, so to say, a traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five job. And I do work in, uh, in an office space for the most part. So that's where my job in a sense is atypical for a hospitality setting. So there is a bit of that, you know, stability in a sense of scheduling or being in alignment um, with not being in a 24 seven um, operation. Um, so a typical day would usually consist of, in pre-COVID times, uh, obviously going to the office, usually catching up on any forms of communication, whether it be email or morning briefings, things of that nature, uh, catching up uh, with the team, and then working out any sort of project rollouts. That's a big part of what I do. And training usually requires a lot of prep. Um, and it depends really on if the training has been launched before and now we're just bringing it back. You said not to uh, consider the COVID factor, but um, a situation just came to mind where we just had our new team member orientation last week. And this is something that we do you know, routinely on a monthly basis in pre-COVID times. But now with an additional factor of COVID and keeping everyone's health and safety, um, you know, uh, comfort levels, and uh, as well as the regulations into consideration, we have to make sure there's little tweaks and ways that you have to get creative in order to make sure that it's delivered seamlessly. Again, the strive is for this project every time to be of, of the greatest um, standards and the highest quality, just like our guest experience. So there's a lot of going back and forth, partnering with people, um, paying attention to details, making sure signups are going out, things of that nature. So that's that would be my day in a nutshell. Great, fantastic. So Mike, I, I bet you I can only imagine, I mean, I, I, I can imagine um, some unique things that obviously happen overnight. Um, but you know what in your new in your new role as the night manager talk about sort of you know how the day typically starts off and, and some of the things you do um, working that that shift through the night yeah um basically 11 to, to 11 to 8 is kind of the the standard time so coming in looking at the first few hours are always helping the front office operations do we have any late arrivals do we have any um, VIP still to come in. I'm not sure if it's similar in uh, Beverly Hills, but we have a lot of, of celebrities and VIPs purposely come in at night um, during the overnight hours just to avoid crowds and, and the whole big to do. Um, so I deal a lot with those as well as sports teams, um, generally in overnight flights and, and that sort of thing. So um, assisting with those that we have probably once a week or so. Um, then once that is all kind of settled and, and the front desk kind of dies down a little bit, touching base with our in-room dining, seeing what our engineers are, are doing in the building, um, security, and then it kind of transitions more into preparing for the morning shift, um, doing the, the audit, kind of consolidating all of the finances for the day, um, and then preparing uh, like the daily briefing packet for morning meetings and, and daily briefings for the entire operations morning team, who's coming in, what our occupancy was, anything that the AM team needs to know for that day, um, as well as any glitches or, or any um, guest challenges that we've had, um, highlighting on those and, and kind of just preparing the AM team to really be fully at their best for the next morning. So that would Fantas be Fantastic. Um, one of the things I was thinking of when you both were speaking that maybe you can touch upon, and if you have to maybe compare it to a previous company or 
co-op place that you've worked, but, you know, tell us all a little bit about maybe what the culture is for your company, because, you know, I'm aware of Four Seasons and I'm, I'm aware of Dorchester, but I'm not sure everybody would understand, you know, each company, whether you're working for a Hyatt, a Marriott, the Holiday Inn down the road, or the Dorchester collection, or Four Seasons, you know, companies have different cultures in terms of expectations, uh, dress, professionalism. Could you touch upon that, Mike, a little bit? You know, um, you know, I know you worked out in Alaska, um, doing a pretty cool job out there. Uh, you, you're obviously in Boston now working uh, at a Four Seasons. Talk a little bit about the culture of Four Seasons since you've been there. Yeah, the culture is very um, guest centric. I mean, we, we try to promote a culture of essentially, as long as it's not illegal, we can do whatever for the guest. Um, you know, we've, we've had em employees drive guests with their vehicles. We've had, you know, people will forget things. We, we do whatever, to, even if it's outlandish, um, we get those requests uh, to do really whatever, whatever the guest would like, as long as we can make it happen, we do do our best to do that. So it is a very guest centric. Um, the expectations are very high from our guests. Um, so we do focus a lot on that. And I know that that Katya, you know, was speaking very employee centric. That is a huge part as well. You know, happy employees make happy guests. Um, I mean, so we really try the front of house should really be treated the same as the back of house. Um, I mean, that that culture of really just making sure everyone is happy in the building, regardless of guest or employee, is, is a vital role. Great. How about yourself, Katya? Um, what would you describe as sort of the Dorchester, you know, culture? If I went to work there, what are some things that I would notice are part of the culture? Absolutely. So uh, Mike did a great way, a, a great job elaborating on the operational piece. Um, so I'm going to take more of the, of course, the people and culture side in terms of culture, because we really believe that it, it stems, everything stems from the culture and the culture really made everyone who had a solid culture, especially throughout this pandemic, that was very, very evident. And I've heard that in more places than one, that if you had a solid culture, you really had nothing to, you know, nothing to worry about. I mean, there was no guests, of course, hospitality was very hard hit, but in terms of your uh, team member commitment, you were safe. And as long as you were providing that psychological safety, you were taking care of your people, you could, you know, we, we can depart this pandemic now, looking back and being proud of being able to not lay anyone off, having kept everyone on full-time salary. You know, that's, that's the commitment that we made to our team going out of it. So. Culture, it's, it's an intangible thing, right? It's, it's a feeling um, and it, it does kind of trickle into everyday interactions, what we do. One thing that I would highlight in particular, and I remember that was a huge thing for me when I first came there, was number one, the, the, the caring culture, the we care, that, that is our motto in Dorchester Collection. And really the, the accessibility, the, the working together, the, this is not my job. I will go out of my way to assist you because you're my colleague and together we can make this happen. And as well as the, uh, even with, with leadership, the, the accountability piece, how approachable the leaders are. I've always described it as being cool, but not co too cool for school. It's, it's, been, it's been an amazing experience and you feel like you belong. And I've very, I'm very privileged to be part of always welcoming new team members in and being proudly in a position where I can speak about this, uh, about our culture. And hopefully then they, they get to see it throughout their time with us as well. Fantastic. Well, before I get into a, a broad question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you both um, more of a specific one that came to mind. So uh, I don't think I'll really put you on the spot, but you know, you're, you're both are working in um, luxury properties and you are obviously have very high uh, daily rates, you know, from six, eight hundred, twelve hundred dollars. Um, so I imagine you have some very demanding guests. Um, and obviously, as you've both alluded to, um, you know, uh, famous guests, um, celebrities. Is there anything that you either learned or were taught in terms of how to handle uh, a guest that may be quite demanding or, um, you know, has very high expectations, maybe not so much based on what the hotel promises, 
but more so what they expect as who they who they are. Um, so any any thoughts on um, I guess serving and supporting um, famous and celebrity guests? I'll have Mike take a stab yeah, at that one. <laughs> um, I've I've dealt with quite a few. Um, some have been fantastic and are down to earth and just want to be treated normal with with no special things. Um, and then some of them come in knowing their status and and being very high expectations of that. Um, so I would say that the main thing that you have to learn is just to not take things personally um, in the operation. That is the, the number one thing, whether it's a, a celebrity who's upset or just a regular guest paying, you know, $1,500 for a suite, um, you need to not take things personally. If you're five minutes late delivering whatever it may be and they yell at you or whatnot, um, I mean, that's that's kind of the main the main takeaway, if I'm not repeating that enough. <laughs> that's a great point. Katya, do you want to add something? I, I fully support that. Usually it's, it's I mean, it's always a, a projection. And that's what like, we we talk about in our trainings a lot. It's like, yes, you, you can't take it personally. And the one thing that I always uh, um, elaborate on when people was like, oh, you work with all these rich and famous people. They must be so entitled. Yes, but I've honestly found that money brings out the best and the worst in people. And on most occasions, it's the best. And I don't know if, Mike, you agree. I think the, I mean, there's people who are demanding and perhaps on night shifts, you, you see a totally different <laughs> array of behaviors come out as well. Uh, however, and the biggest thing is if something does go wrong in a sense and people are going to be very particular about what they want um, but if you do miss something it's key that you have a great recovery um, in in place so a recovery plan it's like how am I going to turn this over before this person leaves and a lot of times if something goes wrong it's usually always an opportunity for you to set things right and make people very very loyal to you because if you're able to turn it around this person oh my god this was incredible and you can kind of hide away whatever that went wrong and really, really make this experience the experience and gain a loyal guest in the process. And I'm sure Mike has tons of stories pertaining yeah, no, to that. She, Katya makes a great point. I mean, that is definitely guest recovery is a huge aspect of it. Um, things will always go wrong at, at one point or another, it's inevitable. Um, but really that, that recovery is such a big, big part of of how do you turn it around and make sure that they don't walk out that door telling 10 people that they should never stay at your property again, so. Fantastic. Um, so just broadly, and, and um, I'll, I'll start with Mike since you just ended there. Um, what skills in general have you found to be, you know, very vital for your career to this point or your, your current position, you know, when it comes to mind, you know, what, what things are kind of key for you to be successful in what you're doing now? Uh, number one, I would have to say is communication. Um, not only just because on the overnight, uh, there's not a huge support system. Um, and it is a very close, tight knit, small team. So communicating to the next people uh, is, is extremely vital. In a 24 hour operation, um, it, it's Everybody has to know everything that's going on in the hotel. Um, you know, whether the AM team, the PM team comes in the next day, 16 hours later, something happened. The guest doesn't care because they, they shouldn't, right? If who's on duty, oh, well, he dealt with it yesterday. Everyone needs to know everything. Um, so communication is, is the most vital thing. Um, Over communicating is still better. Uh, than anything else. So I would say that's the number one aspect um, of, of what is needed in, in the career. Fantastic. How about for you, Katya, what do you think? What skill has sort of served you most or you find most helpful for what you do now? I would definitely echo what Mike said, communicate. I, I mean, it's so cliche. It's like oh, communication, but it's something that we constantly need to work on 
and constantly it's a good thing that it's always elaborated because especially within a hotel an operation that has so many diverse departments it's key to make sure that they're not siloed because you have this one guest that's visiting all these outlets throughout their stay and in order to create a memorable experience you're you benefit through knowing information about this guest and well this happened so if you had a situation where say a guest had a late check-in and this guest is staying us for say three days. Well, now you communicate that, hey, we were able to get this guest on time, but they were unhappy checking in. Well, then let's make sure that when he goes to, or he or she uh, goes to the restaurant, we have to make sure that this experience is impeccable. So now all the outlets are aware that this is a guest to uh, take special care of. So communication, absolutely essential. The one other one that I would add is empathy as well. That is huge and that has, has been huge throughout this pandemic and from a people and culture perspective, it's key. I mean, we've had so many stories and situations, a lot of hardships that our team has gone through, uh, especially through this, this past year. So it's been key to be able to relate uh, beyond perhaps the, the daily transactions or will you come here to get paid? Right, so really being concerned for their well-being, their mental health, um, their family, whatever it is. Um, so, for from a people and culture side, I would also add empathy as a key skill. So, we're going to shift a little bit towards um, your time at RIT and maybe some of the things that influenced you know where you are today. Um, obviously, I know you both, so in, in some of your experiences quite well, um, but you know, thinking about things you could share with those that are on today and those who may look at this later on. Um, I'll start with Katya here. So what are some things you participated in at RIT that maybe shaped your, your abilities, you know, as a, as a manager and leader now and maybe shaped some of your goals? So what were some of the things that you took part in while you were a student that maybe shaped your abilities and goals? Absolutely. So I think any uh, professor within the hospitality department, as well as my um, advisor in the RIT University Studies program is probably chuckling now because they know that I always had a tendency to get over involved in extracurricular activities to a fault. Um, so definitely a lot of great things that have come out of those as a result. I would perhaps highlight everything within the hospitality Department, putting on the Ritz was the first class I ever took. A uh, little shout out to you, Dr. Legowski there, but it was the class that sold me on the industry. And I, like I said, I was writing about like-minded individuals. I was impressed and gave me a taste of what the um, industry or working in the industry was going to be like. So definitely that, as well as um, being part of Eta Sigma Delta, um, hospitality association, any sort of dinners uh, involving Henry's or restaurant. Um, outside of the department, I would have to say uh, Toastmasters. That was a public speaking club on campus that I was a long-term member of, on, on the board of, and it ended up translating into actually being a really, really key, key skill as I present as part of my work. That That's a huge piece of what I do. So having that public speaking practice throughout my time at RIT has, has been a key thing. I could perhaps list uh, student government was a great way to get involved as well. Being a RIT um, university uh, exploration ambassador, any, in any capacity, I think when you have to work with someone, it gives you great exposure outside the classroom as well. Fantastic. How about Mike? Um, talk a little bit about maybe um, some of your experiences at RIT that shaped your your current abilities and, and maybe some of the goals you created for yourself? Yeah, I think um, just a shout out, Katya, again, the Ritz dinner uh, was great. I was involved from that uh, from the get go, eventually um, going from just helping out to um, being the head chef in that uh, and helping out in the kitchen. Um, that tied very much into I was a teacher assistant uh, for Lorraine Hems and for Wines. Um, for many other classes as well, and, and helping out with Henry's and, and being more involved in the kitchen aspect and, and being a TA was, was great. Um, and then I really think that the, the study abroad trips or the visits, um, you know, I did two of those while I was there, um, as well as you know, but uh, going with you to Germany, Croatia, 
uh, making contacts in Croatia. Actually, my first co-op in Alaska uh, was working for a restaurant that uh, was a graduate uh, the the restaurant manager graduated from our Croatia campus. Um, so that okay. was a networking connection as well that way. So I think that the the study abroad trips, getting to see the different cultures and, and really sparking that kind of travel, tourism, hotels aspect uh, switched me from going more into wanting to go culinary uh, into more of the, the hotel side of things. So. Great. Um, I know you just touched upon it a little bit, but can you, um, Mike, talk a little bit about maybe your, you know, pick one or two or your co-op experiences and how that helped you as you alluded to a little bit, maybe it caused you to like look at your direction a little bit, but talk a little bit about your co-op experiences. Yeah. So my co-ops were great. Um, I, I essentially, like I said, made the connection, um, and, and went over to Alaska, um, I, I was the farthest away, most remote nature loving person. I said, I'm gonna to go to Alaska for a summer. Um, I was only going to go for a few months and I ended up going back year and year and year and went for four summers, even after graduating. Um, I went from just working there, um, you know, as, as a front desk agent and in the restaurant to more of eventually becoming the front office manager of that same hotel uh, over the course of the four years. So the, the co-ops were really a great way to get an introduction and in real world operations uh, versus just in the classroom. Um, the culture there in Alaska is very much different now from luxury. So that was also something that I realized was great and fantastic, but it definitely, you know, where do I wanna go and what do I wanna do and, and making that a full career path of where do I want to end up. Um, the co-ops definitely helped me look and analyze that a little bit more even post-graduating. So. Fantastic. So Katya, I, I also know some of your co-op experiences because we've discussed them while you were what? a student. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll let you share whatever co-op experience you'd like to share. Absolutely. Well, I think I'll, I'll actually go with um, my my most recent one was pro perhaps my most significant one. The previous ones that I completed were all at great. Um, I did an internship with Hilton, um, Importane Resorts, uh, all in, in Dubrovnik. So when I finally made the leap, I really wanted to test my, the you know the power of my resume uh, by trying and working in the in the U.S. So I ended up on. I don't even know how that ended up happening, but I was kind of telling everyone, oh, I, I, I'm looking for an internship. So if you know anything, let me know, let me know. And I gave myself an ultimatum saying that if I didn't, I told my parents not to book me a flight home back to Croatia, because I wanted to make sure that I got myself an internship. So I got really obsessive about uh, sending out resumes. And that's, I guess, my message to any prospective student or current, uh, current college students listening is, be persistent, send it out, send it out and tell everyone what you're doing because you might um, end up having a conversation like I did with Dr. Legevsky about, oh, you have family in LA. Hmm, well, there's an alumna actually who lives out there and it would be a pleasure for me to connect you with her. And lo and behold, uh, I ended up going to LA and I remember having the first conversation with this person, Anna Brandt, who was our, um, who's also our alumna, who's been with Rochester Collection for many years. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Legevsky, we were able to establish that connection. I'd never met her before. And I had, I honestly didn't think I would, I would get the internship. She asked me what I wanted to do when I heard the Beverly Hills Hotel. I was like, I'll wash toilets if I need to or clean toilets because it seemed so out of reach. And out of, you know, with compared to anything I've ever done. Uh, but I mean, here we are uh, years later. So I would say that was perhaps the most impactful my co op experience. And I went back the next summer and I was in operations. I uh, worked at the front desk later to come back into people and culture as I felt that was more true, true my truer calling in a sense. But definitely, uh, I mean, RIT. And that connection got me my, my dream career. It got me a career I hope to stay in and um, a great mentor throughout with that. So very, very pleased with my RIT co-op experience. Thank you, RIT. <laughs> oh, 
No, thank you both. I think a, a key thing that I want to highlight for both of you is, you know, both Mike and Katya um, were well known and had created a good brand and reputation for themselves. So their involvement in the department, their involvement in classes, their involvement in clubs and, and so forth. Um, you could speak to any faculty member and they would want to uh, help and connect um, Katya and Mike to any alums because they knew they would represent RIT well, they would represent the person like myself um, or whomever was recommending them. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's an important, you know, viewpoint that I have for students is, you know, make yourself known uh, create a positive reputation for yourself and, and you both did a, a great job um, of that. So again, uh, it's it's been fantastic to see all the great things that you've done and are doing. Um, but what would you say, um, you know, what advice would you give to somebody that's new to this industry or, or going to go into hospitality um, management, what advice would you give? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot that over to Mike. What advice would you give someone new thinking about this career? I would say uh, no one's going to hand you anything. So you have to definitely try to go for it. Um, you know, exactly what Katya said, be persistent. Um, that is such a big thing of you, you really need to be proactive um, and not reactive as my father would say um but but you really it is very true um despite me taking a long time to learn that um but it's it's you no one's going to hand you anything you do have to get out there you have to try you have to make a good name for yourself and be willing to put in the effort and the work um no one's going to hand you anything for free no one's going to well you've done this for a few years let's give you a promotion like it just doesn't doesn't work that way um so I would say go go for it even if it's out of reach um that's how I first got into luxury coming from Alaska um into Boston um it was something that I always thought was out of reach um but you 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 know you you have to take the shot and try it so great gotcha I echo that 100%. And since you quoted your father, Mike, I will quote mine too. <laughs> he said, it's amazing how lucky you can get when you work hard. If he quoted someone else, I apologize. I've, I've always thought he, 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 he carried that. And it's something I know that carried him through his life as well. So definitely don't make any excuses in a sense, if you really want something, you're going to find a way uh, to make it happen. And another thing that I would add, and this is something that I asked, I remember on my first day of orientation at, uh, at the Beverly Hills Hotel and the general manager was delivering a keynote to all the new hires. And I asked them that, like, what is the one piece of advice that you would have for someone entering the industry or um, even for um, prospective students going to RIT? And he said, stay curious. And it's really, and I think that it pertains to several things. Uh, one most recent, re recent thing that comes to mind, especially during the pandemic, just be because things have been done a certain way doesn't mean that we have to continuously be doing it that way. It doesn't mean it can't evolve. So being curious about new ways of doing things and being curious about solutions and finding you know, uh, answers to, uh, to questions, things of that nature. So echo Mike and would also add, uh, stay curious. Great. I guess something I would add um, along these lines, you know, knowing some of your experiences is I think sometimes students or people in careers forget the, um, I'll just call it the hard work that goes into what people have accomplished. And so they often see sort of the, the cover of the book. So they, they see, oh, Katya has got a really cool job on an internship in Beverly Hills. Um, and they think it's all easy, fun, but they don't see the process that Katya went through to get the co-op. Um, I remember speaking to Katya on the bus, on my phone during her co-op, because how long was your commute to work? What was your commute uh, to work? Uh, it was roughly an hour and a half, two hours one way. Right, so Katya was taking a bus in LA, in California. Three. Two, <laughs> right, three buses every day to work one way um, 
because to live somewhere with a relative that was affordable housing for her to be able to do this internship. So often people don't see, you know, what it took to, um, to get a certain position or a certain role, the sort of the work that you two have put in when you were students um, to make good reputations, to have good connections, to network. So I, I think, you know, don't just look at someone's title and the cool role, but realize, you know, that they've worked hard um, to, to get to where they are. It just isn't something magical that happens with no effort, obviously. But I think sometimes people forget because they just see the end result. Oh, they're working for four seasons, um, but not realizing all the different um, jobs and work that built up the skills, you know, for Mike to have his role, for Katya to have her role. So I have about, I think, 10 minutes left. Um, so I wanna make sure, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up now for um, questions. Does anybody want to go ahead and post a question in the chat and I can convey that or I'll give it a minute or two or see if we have any questions. I'm sure there's some people that are dying to also talk to you both. So, so we don't have our awkward silence here. I'll wait to see <laughs> if anybody posts anything in the chat. But, um, you know, I've tried to, I mean, I know it's the reality, but I didn't want it to dominate uh, everybody's thoughts of our industry, but, oh, here we go. Um, Oh, so for Lorraine, oh. I think you, you I'll, I'll read this off. So it's in the, it's in the interpretation in the, the recording. So, um, and I'll open this up to obviously both of you. Um, without breaking confidentiality, is there any one star you were excited to meet? Is there somebody that you met? They're like, oh, it's really cool. I got to meet X, if you're allowed to share. Mike, you go first. You've, I mean, um, I'm an office hermit most of the time. So. I'm trying to think. Um, so I, that I met, I, I have coworkers that um, are huge sports fans. I'm not a sports fan, but I have met all of like the Celtics, um, uh, that's cool. Pittsburgh Penguins, like a, a lot of the teams that didn't do much for me. But um, I would have to say that I think my highlight was doing a special order and making breakfast coffee and delivering it and talking to Meryl Streep. Very cool. That that is really neat. Very cool. Katya, is there anybody in your co-op or anybody uh, that you can think of that you've encountered? I haven't like specifically had, I've had, a, I guess, the conversation, but I, I'm not a baseball fan um, but uh, Joe Torrey is a really really big friend of our GM and so I've had the opportunity to meet him several times very so, cool yeah. so dating myself but you would know both people so at a hotel I worked in um, <laughs> this is a long time ago but people would come into our hotel just to use the Stairmasters when Stairmasters were new um, I know it's not like black and white TV, but, um, and so Michael Jordan would come into the hotel and I was always shocked at just literally how big he was muscular wise. Um, and kind of the most awkward person was Muhammad Ali. And it was really difficult because he would come to our resort because he was always getting treatment for a lot of his problems. And it was very sad to see, you know, how impacted he was from fighting all those years you know it wasn't somebody I felt comfortable talking to I mean when I was there because it just felt awkward but um yeah it's always interesting to see you know different people come in and you know, it's almost kind of awkward right you're staring at you know oh they're famous um anyways so um here's a question for Mike I work for Concord Hospitality and they manage the Renaissance Hotel in Raleigh um what did you say about the four seasons? Um, Connor, I'll let you post that. Are you looking, um, maybe post it another way. I'm not quite sure what the question is. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, 
seems like it was more of a comment. From ah, okay. You, I had a question mark at the end, but we'll skip it. Um, um, so I, I, I think for both of you, um, the question is, you know, in order to grow professionally and personally in this field, you know, is there kind of an expectation that you'll move properties or, you know, the question is also move chains, but I, I think you both can touch upon this. You know, I think, um, you know, Katya, you work for a smaller company. I'm sure there's some thoughts, but again, you tell me about maybe trying to open up new properties or having new experiences. Um, but if you two want to touch upon sort of your thoughts of what it takes to sort of grow um, within your companies. For certain. Mike, I mean, you have the, the bigger company, so perhaps you can give a more comprehensive answer for that. Yeah, um, I mean, it is, it, it is something that is not necessary, uh, but I will say that people who tend to move around and relocate grow in their careers faster um, just because those openings do appear uh, more sporadically around the globe or around the US. Um, I know that it is very frequent my manager used to work in Austin, Texas, and then he worked at the original um, Four Seasons in downtown Boston. Um, many of my other coworkers have have gone back and forth and, and New York City, and, and we had one person just move to Scottsdale for a promotion uh, in housekeeping. So it's, it's something that is not necessarily needed, but if you are very driven, um, and, and are able to do it, it will help you, um, but it's not, it's not needed. Great. I would uh, echo that. We're a lot smaller company, so movement is not as frequent. There's definitely people who go in between properties, and we do have what we call a sister property, so like literally two miles down, um, down the road from us at Hotel Bel Air. Um, however, what we found is also that you can go from hotel to hotel, but because every hotel has its own unique culture, uh, just because it, it is authentic to the location, um, usually it, it, you know, usually the profiles of, of the individuals would, would match uh, the culture that they're going to. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, but for example, at the Beverly Hills Hotel, it's a, it's a very place that you come to be seen and you want to go on the red carpet and you're very much there to for attention versus Hotel Bel Air is more tranquil, more of a getaway place. So it would therefore attract perhaps a different um, candidate profile as well. Um, however, for us, there's a lot of growth diagonally or cross departments. So that's that's the unique feature that I've uh, noticed at our hotel and very proud of that. If you feel that there's a different fit for you or you wanna to go to a different department, you're more than welcome to. So we've seen diagonal growth within our company as well. Great, I was thinking about this question somewhat when you were talking Katia about, you know, if maybe somebody's had a little bit longer check-in, you wanna make sure that communication is placed to other outlets in the hotel. So maybe you can make up for that through something special in a different area. Is there any kind of technology that you're using within um, the Dorchester collection that helps sort of get that information out to different units or out to different managers? Absolutely. So we're actually, it's funny that you asked that, we're in the process of compartmentalizing all the current systems that we have. And it's over, I think, 30 from Opera to Hot Sauce to um, Open Table, all these different systems that unfortunately don't do a good job talking to each other. And that seems to be a common problem. I see Mike nodding. He's oh, like, I know oh. what this is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So the, the goal and the hope is we've launched this new uh, uh, system in which everything will be in one in order to obviously communicate more effectively, get things done more smoothly, have all information about the guests in one place, what they like, their preferences, how many times they've stayed, how much revenue they've generated. So the hope is to have one centralized system and we're in the midst of rolling that out. I believe it's been, it was pre-COVID that we started rolling it out. So in, we're in the midst of that. So the hope is to have just one, but I'm curious to hear Mike's take on well, that. We, we do the same thing. Um, hot sauce is our main one. Um, oh, we, us we too. What we call golden, which is, it was just kind of made a few years ago and it was made custom for us. We're revamping it. So they're doing a lot of changes right now, but it is essentially a, think of a hotel Facebook for our guests that everyone will have access to. So, um, 
you know, photo of them, their stay history, what activities they like, preferences they like. Um, people who tend to stay at Four Seasons properties tend to stay at multiple Four Seasons properties. So it gives somebody an idea of, okay, they just stayed in Miami. They really loved, you know, fresh seafood. You know, when we, when they come and stay at us, uh, you know, with us, we can recommend fish or have special amenities, you know, it, and it, it kind of basically keeps all of their information in one place. Um, so that's something that we're currently revamping and hoping to launch ideally in a month. We'll see when that rolls out. <laughs> Great. So, so Mike, you can either take this um, one or two ways. So what, what classes would you recommend students take that you maybe you've utilized that material the most in what you do now, or what um, class do you wish you took more subjects in that you could use some help with? Um, that's a good question. I would say, um, I forget the name of the class and it was something that CJ taught and it was- it was Quality assessment. Yeah, quality, quality, quality assessment. assessment and improvement. Yep. Something, yeah. something along those lines and really mm -hmm. drilling down on, you know, what is quality? What is service? How do you measure it? Um, and, and making sure that you achieve it day in and day out. Um, that is something that I think really stuck with me. Um, I'll throw in a Wines of the World class, shout out to <laughs> Um but I, I think that anything that was quality or communications, um, I know that that communicating is is a big part of it as well. Um, I'm not 100% sure on what the, the classes are now, uh, but anything that will have you public speaking, te you know, the, the, that aspect of being comfortable talking to more than one person would be very handy. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're at eight o'clock now, and, and I know the time went by quickly for me, so I want to thank you both, but I'm going to just, uh, I know I know Connor had a question, and I just want to reiterate, because he might have missed it early on, um, about the Four Seasons property. Um, as Mike mentioned, um, like a lot of luxury chains, a luxury brand, sorry, um, the actual physical hotels are usually owned by very wealthy owners or investment groups or big companies. And what they do is they think it's a good idea to have a hotel in a certain market, call it Boston, LA, Dubai. Um, and they, they think a certain brand would do well. So they, they work to have a management contract with a brand um, like Four Seasons. So Four Seasons says, yep, well, build a hotel with you and we'll open a hotel, but you own the hotel and, and pay us to, to manage the actual hotel. I, I know with Katya's uh, hotel group, as she mentioned, sometimes um, luxury uh, brands decide to go out and buy iconic uh, hotels and, and take them over and, and build together a group that by, instead of just being one famous hotel, by being part of a group, um, it allows different um, different benefits based on size, right? So whether it's frequent stay programs, reservations, um, lots of different um, benefits. <laughs>